that going. All right, so strange, two weeks in a row, we're here. Knock on wood, maybe the weather stuff is in our past for this season, so we will see. Although, of course, next week we don't meet because it is central spring break. Um, so you do not need to come up here next week. Um, looking down the road just a bit schedule-wise, uh, the week following spring break week, and I'm going to talk more about this tonight, is going to be our alpha testing night. Um, where you're going to be sharing your game ideas around the room and getting some feedback. Not a completed game or something playable, that'll be the beta testing phase. This is simply kind of running the main ideas and the main structure of the game past some other ears to maybe get some input. So that'll be the week following spring break, the next time we meet. And then the week following that is the week that I have, uh, that I'm on this NIAS visit. Um, there's no one here from Ledyard, right? Um, so, but I'm still planning to have class that night. Um, I'm waiting to see, we just got an email, I just got an email a few, few days ago from the chairperson for our visiting committee, um, and they said that our schedule is going to be being sent out to us soon, so I'm kind of waiting to see if they're going to give us a rough idea of what time we're done on Wednesday, because those visits always go through typically a faculty meeting after the school day on Wednesday. Does, has, has anyone done a NIAS visit, been on a visiting committee? Have you been in a school that's been visited or gone to the NIAS? Conference? Oh, yeah, I do both. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 So this bizarre thing where typically this faculty meeting, everybody's there. The visiting committee is sitting there in the front row. Your chairperson does a little presentation to the faculty about sort of just basic wrap-up of findings and so on. And then we are instructed, you're instructed to get up, take your things, and not look at anyone, not talk to anyone, but you get up and you walk out of the school. And that's supposed to avoid you getting pinned down by anybody there saying, well, what about this, or what do you think of this, or whatever, whatever. It's just kind of a bizarre moment. I don't know if they told you to have you do the same thing or whatever. Uh, I just remember it's a totally strange thing where we were just told, you stand up, you don't say a word, you don't acknowledge anything, you just walk out of the school and leave. So. Well, I knew yeah. the person who was evaluating our school because we just had it done this year. Oh, I see. So, so she was my end. mentor teacher when I was a student teacher. Oh. So I was like, hey, yeah. I snagged her, so she wasn't getting away. But gotcha. The other yeah. lady did kind of indicate that she was a student. Yeah. So, um, so in any case, so, so. My hope is, is that they get done at a typical high school time around 2, 2.30 or so, and then even staying afterwards for a half an hour, an hour, I will still have time to get from Ledger to here. There is a small possibility on that evening, once I know what the schedule is and can look at timing, that we may need to start that evening's class a little later, um, but I'll, I'll let you guys know as soon as I hear anything. I'm just waiting to hear um, what sort of details they give us on schedule. Um, and then after that, it should be smooth sailing pretty much from there on out um, to the end of the course uh, in terms of anything related to schedule. So just to kind of recap that. Um, another thing from Dr. Abed, um, he is going to be meeting with you guys in two weeks at our next meeting to do advising for signing up for courses for the summer and for next fall. Uh, and the plan is he has a class on Wednesday nights that gets done at 7. So starting at 7 o'clock on that night, he's just going to start pulling you out one at a time and having a quick meeting with you about what you're supposed to be signing up for. Um, and for those of you that are in both the 530 and the 520, that'll take care of both. Um, so you don't have to meet with them separately for, for, uh, from the other class. So that'll be something that's happening towards the end of our next class meeting. Do you know how many they're going to offer um, I don't know what the plan is this summer. The only the, I'm not teaching any of the master's program classes this summer, um, so I don't know. I'm not sure what their what the plan is in terms of offering and so on. Is it just one? Yeah, I thought it'd be. Well, I don't know. Whatever. If he's talked to you already, then. I, I haven't really. Oh, I mean, it was, you had a course out there. I don't, I want my it was. Right. That. What, were you looking on the Moodle or were you looking?
through the CCSU? Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's the 540 class is actually for 092, for the 092 program. So that's a class for the six year program. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I thought there was at least one other that, that somebody else is covering this next summer too. I don't, I don't know. So, but anyways, all your questions should be answered next week. I'm sure if you emailed him, if you had questions ahead of time. Um, so he just wanted me to make you aware of, uh, of that for next time, for two weeks. I'm going to keep saying next week, just understand that what I really mean is in two weeks. Um, so uh, with that said, um, just wanted to kick off with if there are any questions, comments. Um, I know that um, in terms of the Powtoon projects, those pretty much should be submitted by now. I haven't had a chance to go through them. Um, my goal is that by the next time I see you, they will all be graded and I'll have feedback for you and all of that. So that's sort of my thought on the week off is to use that week to really go through everybody's Powtoons and get that wrapped up. Um, I know I, I still had a couple of people asking about whether I had received the the Powtoon or not, and I've tried to get back to all of those, but if anybody still has a question about whether I received the assignment, I think I, I think everybody at this point, I've gotten the, the Word document submission. Um, I haven't necessarily gone into them to see if the link was there, but if I go into Powtoon, I, it does look like I have at least most of the projects. Um, but if you have a specific question about yours, just, just let me know, get in touch with me. But I'm going to try to go through those over the course of the next couple of weeks um, so that we can wrap those up. Um, so any, anything else related to sort of past work, previous questions, comments, criticisms? In good shape. Over the, um, sort of over the past week, have you had a chance to continue to shape ideas related to your game topic and so on? I kind of glanced through the, the wikis on that, um, and it looks like there's progress, at least with each group on that, whether or not a final topic has been decided or not, but any issues revolving around those sorts of things. I know because we're missing a bunch of people tonight. I, I know I guess two people are from one group. I'm not sure if the other two are both. One from our group. Okay, so one, and then must be one from one of the other groups. So um, we will get some more time tonight to do some work in the groups. Um, so you will get some direct contact time here with whoever is here. Um, but that's going to be a bigger and bigger piece of as we move forward. I'm going to try to, most weeks, schedule some chunk of time in each class to have just some lab time for the groups, just so that you do have some face-to-face -face time in addition to whatever you work out um, off uh, out, outside of class. All right, so no other questions, comments? Things are going okay-ish? Ish. All right, so tonight, the topic tonight is if the focus of the last couple of weeks has been on the A of the ADDI, the analyzing. So you've been trying to state a problem, you've been analyzing your audience, you've been trying to think about uh, content and about um, you know, what you're gonna need or what kind of a thing you're gonna develop in order to address the problem. Tonight we're going to be shifting our gears more towards the D, the first D of the Addy, which is design. Um, so the, the goal of tonight is to, um, to take a look at some of the questions that your group should be addressing in the design phase of, of uh, developing your game. So we're going to be talking about just some categorization of games, thinking about what type of a game are you looking to make at a basic level? Is it a card game? Is it a board game? Is it a, a dice game? Is it a tile game? That kind of question. Um, so we're going to be taking a look at that kind of structural types of games, um, continuing to use that definition that we got, that we were using last week, 
I did make a couple of adjustments to it. So when you see it tonight, based on our discussions last week, I added in two elements. Um, somebody had brought up the element of there needs to be an end to the game. Um, so I incorporated that in. I know we had said last week that the idea of competition um, sort of it implied an end game, but I thought it would be better to have it stated explicitly. And I also added uh, one word to the um, ambiguous decision making um, that we'll look at too. So, so we're gonna start thinking about design and in order to do that, we're gonna take a real world game. Um, and I guess I should ask this, is there anyone in here who is not familiar with Uno? I was gonna see if I could out, out uh, dead face your <laughs> dead hand delivery. You, you did. So, um, yes, yeah, so here's a vacuum pump. Paid off. Um, so we're gonna use Uno because it's, on the surface at least, a relatively straightforward game that most people are familiar with. Um, so we're gonna look at it and we're gonna start by categorizing it. What kind of a game is it? What kinds of things are going on in the game? Um, and then the, the small group activity for tonight is going to be a little arts and crafts, um, creating a flow chart of the game. Um, so you're going to take the official rules, and I, and I did post the official rules from the Mattel website. Um, and believe it or not, there are actual websites where the entire website name is something like unorules.com where they just discussed the rules for UNO. Uh, but I figured I'd go straight to the source, because believe it or not, there are actually some, some disagreements about certain aspects of the game of UNO. So we're gonna work from the actual official published rules, and using them, go through a process of trying to develop a flow chart of the game. Because um, that's a process that your group is gonna want to engage in with your own game. Um, there's a couple of different ways to do this, but flow charting or something similar to that seems to be one of the more effective because it allows you to really plan out the sequence of what happens in your game, you know, what happens at each stage. It lets you catch dead ends. Um, if you're developing your instructions and you're basing a flow chart off of it, you discover you've got a little orphan thing where a player could potentially work their way over here and then they're there's no way out, then that tells you you've got to work something into the rules that's going to loop them back into the game or get rid of that, that uh, spot. So, um, so developing the ability of kind of thinking through a game from that level of, you know, what is the step-by-step? -step? What happens at each stage? Where do, the, where do the meaningful, ambiguous decisions occur in the game? Because if there aren't any, then it's technically not a game. So we're going to try to identify where those happen. So that'll be our group activity tonight is, is pulling that game apart. And I brought big paper and pens and post-its and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and then once we've gone through that, um, we'll get some time then to start working into some of those design questions for your group game. Once we've had a chance to kind of analyze UNO and discuss what we found, um, you'll get some time with your group to start thinking through, well, are we doing a board game or do we want to do a card game? Or, um, you know, that's those sorts of questions. So we can start to sketch out the outline of the actual game now that you've hopefully got a good idea of what the topic of the game is going to be. So that's kind of the overview of, um, of the evening. So any questions so far? I almost considered bringing in Uno but then I figured we'd all just get distracted and start playing Uno, um, which maybe isn't a bad thing, but. All right. So here is, let me go into this. Started. Um, 
we're going to kind of do this side by side. So we're going to start developing. We're going to start developing the the um, analysis of Uno as we talk about these questions, but. These are basically the, the same set of questions or decisions that you're going to be being asked to make within your group about your game. So we're going to use UNO as a way to discuss what each of these means. Some of them are relatively obvious, but other ones we might need a little clarification on what they are. Um, so, and I'm just going to sort of record our answers up here, our, our um, results up here. But I started off with restating our um, definition, which I did add. So what I added was meaningful. Um, if you read the article that we based the definition off of last week, he did talk quite a bit about meaningful, and I'm kind of surprised he didn't put it in his own definition. And that doesn't mean that it's got meaning for you, that it's meaningful that way, but that the decisions actually affect the outcome of the game. They can actually change the course of where the game goes. It's not just a matter of, of getting the right thing in the right slot. It's you actually have to think about it and based on the decision it will actually branch the direction that the game can go. So I put that word in there and then like I said um, because we had brought it up last week I added on to the end to reach a defined end game. Um, I think initially I was trying to make the case that the, the compete part of it sort of implied an end game, but as I thought about it, I said, well, you can have competitions that just keep going and never have an end game. So I figured it would be good to put that in there too, and that's also gonna help clarify, I mean, obviously for your game, you're gonna have to figure out how do we know when the game is done? What's the, what's the final thing? Is it something like the game of life, where it's when you reach the end of the board, you're done? Or is it something like Uno, where the game could go on for a very, very, very long time until a certain condition is met. Um, by the way, I think Monopoly, I think the record for the longest game of Monopoly was something close to a year or something like that. That they uh, kept going. Nobody, Monopoly is another game that, that nobody plays according to the actual rules. Yeah. There's a whole thing that's supposed to go on with like, Trading properties and things like that, and yeah, and then, uh, the rent and the, yeah, yeah so and if you actually play it according to the rules, that game can potentially just keep going and going and going. In fact, that what I read said that they actually had to get a, an extra shipment of play money delivered because they the bank had gone out of run out of money for the game, and they like this whole thing. There's all these crazy things about Monopoly. So anyway, so having an end game is also part of the definition. And again, in, he does talk about it in the article. I think he talks about, I think he uses the word simulations or something to describe things where you have rules and you have agents and you've got decisions, but there's no end game. He calls that a simulation where it, you know, it's like playing SimCity. There's no real point where it's done. You're still making meaningful decisions that affect outcomes, and you've got agents, and, and there's competition, and there's a system of rules, but it doesn't really qualify as a game because there's no point where the game comes to a conclusion. So I just added those things in there. So, so just working our way down here, like I said, a couple of these are going to be really, really obvious. But the first one is the game delivery mode. Um, Basically, just what type of a game is it? And there are a lot of types of games. I guess, actually, I should say this before we get into this, too. This course is going to scratch the surface of game construction and game theory. Um, you can do doctoral degrees in game theory these days. It's an incredibly deep topic with a lot of theory behind it. So I'm not intending for this class to be like making you guys masters of game theory. Um, so a lot of this stuff is more going to be kind of across the surface of what makes games. But in terms of delivery modes, board games, card games, video games, dice games, tile games, um, all sorts of other types of things. So obviously one of the first choices or first decisions your group is going to want to make is to kind of decide what mode is the game going to be in. Um, and I'm not going to specify that. I'm not going to say it has to be a board game or it has to be a this. 
you're going to have to look at your content, look at your audience, um, and think about which mode might be the most motivational for your topic, for your age group. You know, sometimes board games may get too involved rule-wise, and you may want to simplify things down to a, to a simpler game that's maybe a card game or a, something like that. But in this case, what is Uno? It's a card game, yeah. Can we make that game off of the current uh, board game or card game, like, similar to it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be awfully hard at this point to come up with a truly unique game. Right. You know, again, a lot of games have been designed over the thousands of years of human history. So chances are pretty good. And, it, and at this point, there are kind of, it's almost like there are arch game archetypes. And most new games just feed into one of those archetypes. So, so yeah, there are, and again, if you go online or do some searching on game theory, they do get into sort of what are the, accepted structural prototypes for different games and then really just becomes variations of those things with different content or slightly different rules or something along those lines so um, yeah so I think that one's pretty obvious but your group should give it some thought um, from what I've seen from the past uh, in this course a lot of groups do focus on the board game which is totally fine um, but don't go into it just assuming that you have to do a board game if you think that a different mode is going to is going to work better. Um, I'd probably stay away from video games because that gets into programming, and unless you already have a pretty developed background in programming, you probably don't want to go down um, that rabbit hole. Um, dice, an actual dice game probably isn't going to be very instructional, but you may be using dice as an aspect of the game. Um, and I should point that out too, there's obviously overlaps too. So you play um, Sorry, Sorry would be a what kind of game? A board game, but it's all about drawing cards, right? But the main mode of the game is about the board, whereas something like, um, oh, what's the... Uh, that, yeah, so there, I mean, a lot of games obviously use a dice, but it's not a dice game. The dice isn't the, the controlling factor of the game. Um, I was trying to think, what's the, what's the card game that has the pegs that go around the cribbage. cribbage? So cribbage has a board, but the board is really just used to keep track of points as opposed to being sort of an integral part of the game. So... So when assigning a mode, do real, you, know, you can combine different elements. A lot of board games have dice or have cards and vice versa. Um, so like Yahtzee would be a dice game, but it also has pen and paper. That's another style of game is pen and paper games. Um, but again, that's just about keeping track of your, your progress. And this is something that we're physically going to actually, this isn't just like, Theory, yes, we are going to have an actual game. something that somebody can sit down and actually play. Okay. So, um, yeah, so keep that in mind, too, because uh, you there are going to be pieces and elements that need to be physically created. So you don't want to create something so complicated that you're, unless you have like a 3D printer at home and can print. I got one of those. I have a tool, too. Oh, yeah? Our school has a couple now. In fact, 3D we printers? 3D printers, yeah. yeah. They're, wow. We have, so our students all have these, these personal learning devices now, these, these laptops, and they have a stylus. And they discovered very on that this, early on the styluses were not very well designed, and the tips kept breaking off because students would flick them on the side and then shove them in their backpacks, and the tips get snapped off. So they actually, our, our drafting studio, which has a 3D printer, designed a cap for the pens and started printing caps. And so the students like would just go and pick up their caps, but the caps were being printed off of a 3D printer instead of going somewhere and having them bought. So anyways, all right, how do we get onto that? I don't know. Okay, so, um, so then the next question is, is about the competitive agents. That is one of our, our requirements is that there have to be agents competing. And in this case, there's not just two choices, but kind of two main ideas for games, which is either 
player or players versus other player or players. And that could be one versus one, or it could be a whole bunch versus each other. Or is it where it's the, the player versus the game or the rules? Um, which immediately what comes to mind is solitaire, but it doesn't have to be. There could be a cooperative game where all of the human players are working together against the rules or the, the game itself as they go through. As long as there's some sort of a, a competition happening there, it still falls into our definition of a game. Um, so that's going to be something to consider too. And that might be a way to address, we brought up last week the issue of in a, in a class setting having winners and losers. Um, one way maybe to address that would be to look at, well, maybe it's the students versus the game. And then at least within the human players, they all experience the same outcome instead of not. But depending on your age group you're working with, depending on the content, that may or may not really be an issue. But that's one thing to think about is, is who are the, the people or what are the agents that are competing in this game. Um, so in terms of UNO, what is, what is the typical configuration for UNO in terms of who the agents are? Yeah, player versus player. I think I should check the rule. Oh, somebody's got the rules up. Is it up to 10 players, I think? Or at the top, it should say max two to 10 players. OK. What's that? Seems like a lot. It is a lot. It, the game becomes actually a lot more interesting when there's more people involved. With it. But um, So in this case, player versus player, and we could say up to 10. And that also brings up something if you are doing people versus people, is there a limit to how many can be involved? So if it's a game you're doing in a classroom, do you have to break it up into small groups that are playing it? Can an entire class be involved with it? Um, can you have teams competing against each other? There is actually a way to play UNO on teams. They, they give a variation that allows for team play in UNO. Um, so there are some options there to think about too. but. But you are going to want to give that some consideration. I mean, from a practical standpoint, if you're doing a board game um, and you can have up to six players, then that probably means you're going to need at least six playing pieces or whatever you're going to use to move around the board game with. Um, if you're doing a card game, you need to make sure that whatever, however you're structuring the cards, that you have enough cards to handle all you know, the range of, of possible players. Um, is anybody familiar with Exploding Kittens, the card game? No? It's, it, was a, it made a splash about a year or so ago, and it's, it's, kind of, it's just a weird, fun sort of card game. My daughter likes to play it with us. Um, but because of the makeup of the game, they, they, you get one deck, but depending on the number of players, there are certain, if you play with X number of players, you go through the deck, and there are certain cards you remove out of the deck because they've learned that depending on the number of players, you, you can only make the game work with a certain number of cards. So you play with a partial deck if you're only playing with up to four players, but then if you're over four players, you use the full deck. Um, and there's a couple of, actually, I think it's two different things. So one's for one group and then a different, the other section of the deck for a different size group, and then you put the two halves of the deck together if you're playing with a big group. Um, so that would be something to think about as well in terms of just practical, what does it mean, how many people could be playing this at once, or groups. Okay, so we now know that this is a card game that can be played by two to ten players um, playing against each other. So informational style, what do you, the, the two options here are perfect versus imperfect. What do you think this might refer to in terms of a game? Well, it would be, it's sort of a description of a game. A game can have, it be a, a perfect informational style or an imperfect informational Actual. style. Actual. It's a good guess. It's, I was thinking it would be perfect. It's pretty concrete, like the car. Okay, so you're saying that the perfect and imperfect relates to? Like 
the physical items in the game. Or maybe like you're given the information versus you're creating the information. You're getting closer. Um, being imperfect in that you don't know all the information, like the other person in the squad. Yeah, there's the key. So if you're in a game like Checkers, at any given moment, every player in the game knows the position of every piece. There's no hidden information. So when you're as, when you as a player are making decisions, you're making decisions on all of the available information. Nothing is hidden from you. If you think of a typical card game, every time you make a play, you're making that play based on incomplete information. You don't know what the other players have. You don't know what the next card is that you're going to draw off the pile. So, um, yeah, so it's it's kind of, it, it inter introduces luck and chance into the game if it's imperfect information. Um, so that's going to be something to, to address as well. When, as the players are playing the game, are there things in the game that only given players know at a given time? Or does everybody know everything that's going on and are making their decisions from there? Games work either way. I mean, checkers and chess and go and those types of games are all highly successful games and highly strategic games. And everybody knows everything. And yet still, you know, most chess games or go games go completely different directions in a given game. Whereas cards are usually the one that are used as examples of imperfect. By design, cards don't let you see what one side of the card is if you're looking at the other side of the card. And the whole point of that is to hide information. You know, poker wouldn't work if everybody knew what everybody's cards were. It just it wouldn't function as a game. So you're going to want to, to address that um, as you're thinking about your game. Does, is everybody aware of the complete situation of the game at every moment? Or... For whatever reason, are there elements that you want to have hidden um, that can, I mean, that can also help to make the, the decisions more ambiguous, right? If you don't know what everyone else has, you don't really know whether the decision you make is how that's going to affect the outcome. Um, so that can be a good way to, to build that in. So does that make sense yeah. in terms of a description, right? So what is UNO? It's imperfect. It's kind of giving it away because it is a because it is a card game. We don't know, you know, what is what's going on. Um, what was I just saying? A clue is another great one. That's an imperfect. The whole the whole point of clue is the imperfect part of it that you don't know. You're trying to find out the thing that you don't know, which is what are the three cards that have been tucked into the little envelope. And the only way you do that is by trying to fill in the gaps without filling in the gaps for other people playing the game. All right, uh, next one up is developmental style, progressive versus repetitive. Um, so this is just an, another thing to take into consideration. As the game goes along, is essentially every round of the game identical in terms of what the options are and what's being done? Or does the game progress as you go? So, you know, something like Uno, oh, I shouldn't give it away because that's what we're supposed to answer. Um, something like uh, Checkers would be repetitive, right? Basically, every turn is identical to the others just in terms of what you do on each turn. A game like Dungeons and Dragons, more progressive. Because as you go through the game, the game actually changes, gets more difficult, works through different scenarios, follows a storyline. So at, at each stage of the game, the types of decisions being made changes and so on. So in, in terms of your own game, do you want the game to, to evolve as the game progresses? Or do you want to simply keep sort of the same cycle that's repetitive. Yeah. Monopoly. It's the same. You do the same thing. You do do the same thing, but I would call it progressive because it does. 
you do actually reach stages in the game. Like you get to a certain point and you can start putting houses and, and hotels out. And then that sort of changes the dynamic of the game. Um, you get to a point where people have to start mortgaging properties. That changes the dynamic of the game. So, the yeah, the basic sort of steps of a turn are generally the same. You roll the dice and you move your piece. But the, the structure around those movements does evolve as the game evolves. Um, so, yeah, I would put it more toward, I mean, it's kind of more of a spectrum than a hard A or B. But I would put Monopoly towards the progressive end of things, or the developed progressive. Um, so what would Uno be? A repetitive, yeah. Because essentially, every turn, aside from the specifics of what card is put down, which might change your next options, the game doesn't really get more complicated as you go, or less complicated, or the rules don't change. Uh, or the parameters don't evolve, really the game stays the same until somebody finishes the game. And that's maybe part of the reason why it can go on for so long is, is that it doesn't actually change or more. All right, so, um, so, so far we have a card game that can be played by two to 10 uh, human players. It is an imperfect informational style that has a repetitive development to it or a repetitive play style to it. So then, and this is more just a, at this point, a double checking. Are there meaningful, ambiguous decisions that are made in UNO? What are they? Or what is it? Right. So every time it's your turn, generally speaking, sometimes you don't really have a choice because you may only have one card you can play, but Generally speaking, you make a decision each time it's your turn of which card to play. You don't know for sure which card you're playing is going to be the better choice. That's the ambiguous nature. You could say, well, of course, this always plays in at the very end of the game, right? Somebody's got one card and everyone's trying to guess what, what suit is it, what, you know, what number is it. So you're the person right before that last person, and you can either change the color or keep the color the same. You don't know. So you're making an ambiguous decision with imperfect information. So you make a decision and you play it. That decision is meaningful because it does affect the outcome of the game. If you kept the color the same and that's the color the last player had, you've just triggered the end of the game. Or if it's not, then the next person has to draw a card, and all of a sudden they're back into the playing of the game. So, so in this game, there's definitely meaningful, ambiguous decisions. That's really it. I mean, in this game, that is really the only decision you make, and you make that decision over and over and over again, and that's fine. A game doesn't have to have 50 different decisions. It can. It can have a different decision you need to make each step along the way, but it's also okay to have a game where essentially the, the basic type of decision that's being made is the same each time around. As long as it is meaningful, as long as it changes the course of the game, and as long as it is ambiguous, meaning that it can't just be, um, you know, that you know if I do this, that will be the best choice. You know, even in a game like chess, even in a game where you can see all the information, you can't read your, your opponent's brain. You don't know what strategy they're pursuing. So even though you may have more information about the state of the game, it's still an ambiguous decision because you have a lot of choices, and you may make one thinking that your opponent is going for this strategy when actually they're going for a different strategy. So they're still ambiguous in that case. So, so in the case of, of Uno, it's simply deciding which card to play. And you do that over and over and over again, but it is meaningful, ambiguous, and it is a decision. My guess is, in an instructional setting, this may be the point where groups might struggle the most. Because a lot of times in instruction, there is sort of an answer that is correct. Right? So 
just be careful that you're not turning your game just into a puzzle that needs to be solved, right? Just answer the right question each time and, and you're done. They need to be decisions that can actually change the outcome of the game, change what direction the game goes in. So keep that one in mind. And I, I'm just anticipating sort of thinking through it that from an educational standpoint, this might be a tougher one to pull off, depending on your topic, um, because it can't just be puzzle solving. It's got to have something where the, the, the person answering doesn't know what their choice is going to do for the game, and that depending on what they choose, it could change the direction that the game goes in. Okay? Could, you, could the decision be ambiguous? Yeah, that thing. That thing. The AD. Yep. Uh, could it be an element in the game in terms of how they play, like go this way or that way, or to choose this stack or that stack? Yeah, I mean, again, just think about what ambiguous and meaningful yeah. mean. So the ambiguous just means that they, they won't know which, which choice is going to be the better choice. Right. And in fact, one time through the game, the better choice might be to go to the right, but in a different playing of the game, the better choice might be to go to the left. Yeah, so it can't, it can't just be something where there's, you always know you just go this way and that's it. Because I'm even thinking of like Jeopardy. Like when I play Jeopardy with my students in the classroom, it's like, you just didn't say that we do for a test. Like they work in teams and they get to pick where they are and they know there's two daily doubles or whatever. And, right. You know, they have to figure out which one they want to go, what strategy do they want to go for the big numbers first or they want right. to work there so that so they're those still. are ambiguous because okay. they they don't know if choosing this square or that square is going to result in the better outcome for them okay. they choose this one it's a daily double but it's a question they can't answer maybe they lose a lot of money if they choose the other one it's not the daily double but they get it they might end up in a better situation so so yeah and it is meaningful because the result of that choice that impact their standing in the game, how many points they have, that okay. sort of a thing. So, um, so just just keep it in mind that that bit right there. I don't think we're going to have problems with systems of rules. We're teachers. We invent systems of rules in our sleep. Right. Everything we do in our classroom, we have a system of rules for. Agents competing. That's going to be pretty straightforward. Maybe just figuring out what the groupings are or how many. I think this is going to be the one to, to really stay true to the idea of a game to make sure that your game is really adhering to that. There can't just be one right answer that they're finding. That's in the article, to go back to last week's article, that's where his problem with video games and being able to save video games is that every time there's a branching, there's like a right way to go and a wrong way. And so people save the game. They make one choice, they find out that was the wrong answer, they back up, they make the other choice. So that wasn't really a meaningful decision because there was only one correct right answer. And once they've discovered that, they can play the game the same way every time and get the same result in the end. They know, I always go left at this turn, I always go right here, I always pick B on this question. That's not, that doesn't really become a meaningful decision at that point. At that point, it's just memorizing what the right answers are. Okay. All right. So, so that's that. So now we're, we're getting a pretty good sense of UNO in terms of its structure. So the final thing is, is there an end game to UNO? Yeah. We I hope. Know there are points. <laughs> yeah, there actually, no there's. <laughs> actually a game of points? I thought it was just the first one out wins. Boom, everybody else is a yeah. loser. Um, sometimes games of Uno can go on for a very long time, and if you have a seven, six-year-old daughter, she gets bored and doesn't want to keep going, and in that case, you just stop. Um, but there is, a, there is a point in the rules for the end game for Uno. Um, we'll go, there is a point system, which a lot of you now are discovering, we can call the end game, you know, the first player with no cards. Because technically that's the point that triggers then how many points did everybody get or how many points did everybody lose. And then at that point it's a matter of playing a number of rounds until a person reaches a particular threshold. But 
in a in a single statement of the game, when the when somebody plays their last card, that's when play stops. So that is that is our end game in this case. So again, instructionally or with your games design wise, what is going to end the game? Is it more open ended? Like Uno, where play could keep continuing under certain circumstances until some state is reached? Or is it something more like the game of life, where there's a very finite, you know, you go through the path, and when you get to the end of the path, the game is done? Um, or Sorry, where once you get all of your pieces into the home, the game is done. Um, so you're going to want to think about that, too. Um, and also instructionally, the end game is a good point to also double check when your players get to this point, will they have learned what it is they're supposed to have learned from the game or be able to do what they're supposed to be able to do from the game. Because that's kind of the point where you, could, you should be able to, as an instructional thing, give a little assessment and see whether they've actually learned the material, the, the topic, the subject, the skill that the game is teaching. So you're going to want to make sure that the end game kind of takes into account, well, at what point will my students know what they need to know? And then how do we end the game at that point? All right. So, so these, in terms of design, this is a series of questions that, that your group is going to be answering about your own game. You may not have all the answers right now, but you're going to want to start thinking about this. This will help you focus in on some of the structural elements of your game. Once you know, is it a board game or a card game? Once you know how many players can be involved. Once you know, you know what kind of meaningful, ambiguous decisions are your players going to be making in the game. This is going to really help to, I think, get the game off the ground and really start helping you focus in on the specifics of the rules and the gameplay and the rest of it. So from a design standpoint, this is sort of the design piece, the addy, the first D of the design for the instructional design. It's just getting the game description in place. Questions about any of this? Anything you think we should add to this? Yeah. Uh, just the what is it, the um, the specific style of game being the very mode. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Now you're not. I can read stuff that's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I'm wondering if it could be like a card game, but involve physical people. Oh yeah, Kin kinesthetic games. Yeah. Movement games. Yeah. Sure. I'm yeah, yeah. That. Um, what? Oh, what's the one my daughter used to always play? Uh. What was it called? It had a, a thing on the ground and all these pads you would sprinkle around and each pad had a color and a shape. And a, oh, it wasn't Twister, oh, but it, was a K. Uh, uh, yeah, what was it? But basically you would, you would put all these sort of little rubber mats down on the floor and each one had a, a thing on it, a, a shape and a color. And then you would push a little thing in the middle of the floor and it would make some music and then it would say like, put your hand on a yellow. And so then you'd quickly have to like get a hand on it. So it's kind of twister-ish, but it had a little, but you were moving Simon? around. No, it's, I, I, I can't remember the name of the game now because she hasn't played it in years. But but yeah, that's sort of a game, getting up and moving around, sure. Especially yeah. if you're working with younger kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. get them up out of their seats. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a whole, yeah, I could have put that in here. That's a whole other genre of games is kinesthetic games, movement games. Um, so absolutely, you know. So yeah, you can get you can get creative with it. This is not an exhaustive list. If you want to, you can go online and and overwhelm yourself with all the discussions of the different categories of types of games. Um, but uh, but these are some of the major ones. You know, like a tile game would be something like dominoes or uh, mahjong uh, games that are played with with pieces that are stacked or placed. Bananagrams? That would be it. Bananagrams. I love bananagrams. I play bananagrams all the time. Um, so yeah. So in terms of delivery mode, and yes, there is crossover. Most most cases, your game is going to have some element. I mean, if you're moving around a board, you've got to have some way for the students to know how far they move on each turn, and that's usually dice or drawing a card. Um, if 
if you've got a dice game, you may need a board in order for them to keep track of points or things like that. But this sort of refers to the main, like what is the main piece of the game? Where is the game actually being played? All right. Other questions? All right, so now we get into the arts and crafts part of the evening. So, um, let's see, what do I need? I need, uh, let me go, let me save this first. So the bottom line now, now that we've got a handle on UNO from a gestalt perspective, from an overall perspective, um, what we're going to do now is break up into some small groups, and we're going to go old school with this and go with the big pieces of paper and the post-its and the markers and the tape and all of that. And the idea now is to start to flow chart the game. Um, this is probably the least, the, the most design-oriented, least instructionally-oriented part of the game design part, because this is where you're actually getting into the nitty-gritty of the actual game play and what happens and in what sequence and what decisions are made and where. Um, but it's a key activity you're going to have to go through. Um, this will kind of probably be done hand-in-hand -hand with developing your rules, because what you can do is write a rule and then put that into the flowchart to see what that rule does to the game and allow you to cover the possibilities. Or if you you know what the game should do, then you can write rules that will make sure that those options are the way that the game plays. So overall, what your group is going to do is just familiarize yourself with the rules of the game if you don't know. And I, I posted the, the, the copy of the rules. You're going to start working through the rules for a round of play. I'm going to get everyone started. We're going to do sort of the, the overview flow chart up here. You're going to be focusing in basically on the middle segment of the game, the actual rounds, the actual turns that happen. Um, and you're going to turn that into a flow chart. Um, anything that's an action where something happens, that'll be a rectangle or, a, I guess, a square. And then anywhere that the decisions happen, anywhere that the, the player has to make a choice, those are going to be diamonds in flowchart terminology. So this is something happening. This is someone making a decision. Um, there should be no dead ends. So as you're going through the rules and going through your flowchart, you shouldn't have something that leaves a player with nowhere to go. Um, Uno has been played enough times that I think they've kind of accounted for every possibility. So you should be able to loop everything in. So every, every point in the game should be part of, as I call it, a forward motion through the gameplay loop. So there should be an out. The only um, dead end should be the end of the game. Player has no cards left. That should be the only place. Um, I'm giving you post-its because what you're probably going to find or a good way to approach it is to start with sort of the main things that happen, and then start to build out the sub things that happen to get you from one to the next. So um, it may just be, you know, player plays a card. But then you may need to back up before that once you have that element and say, well, what cards can they play? So you might have to have one that says, you know, look at the, the card on the top of the discard pile and get the type and the color or something along those lines. So with, with post-its, you should be able to move things around. Um, I've got markers, if you maybe you want to do your connections initially with pencil or something like that, um, just so that you can move the things as, as you build it out um, as you go. I honestly don't know if we're going to, I, I don't know how much time this is exactly going to take to get through this particular game in this way. Um, so it's possible we may just sort of run out of time and just sort of stop with what people have gotten to. So don't panic if, if you feel like you haven't gotten the whole game mapped out by the time we're done. Get as much as you can. It's really more, I just want you to go through the process of having to dig into a process like a game and see what all of the pieces are. Um, I don't know how many of you, I know Dr. Abed does an activity, I think making an omelet. I don't know if anyone's had the class where he does that. That might be a little later on. 
where he has people flow chart what it, how to make an omelet. And you think, oh, well, make an omelet. You do this, 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 and you're done. But then when you start going into it, like, get out the pan, put the pan on the stove, turn the stove on to such and such. Like, you can get into finer and finer details on flow charts. Um, so I, I, I just don't know. I just want to give you an introduction to the process. Don't stress out if you don't have the entire game mapped out um, by the time uh, that we're done. Um, just see what it's like to think through a game from this perspective, from kind of what happens and what does that look like when it's laid out. Because you're gonna, your group will be going through this um, with your own game. You're going to want to develop a flow chart that as you add elements to the game, you're kind of keeping track of what does this mean and what rules do we have to write to get uh, to get to this. Okay? So um, just to get us started, I'm just going to put a couple of things up here just as a, as a general framework. So to start with, I'm going to use... Oh, Um, I'm going to use an oval to indicate the beginning and the ending of the game. So the first thing that we have is, is the start of the game. Ooh, that's awfully big. All right. And part of the start of the game, and you don't have to worry about this, would be what is the setup for the game? So like, what is, what is the setup for Uno, generally speaking? You shuffle the cards. You get them out of the box. So you deal how many? Seven. Every player gets seven cards. And then the rest of the cards are put face down. And then one, one card is flipped over. All right. So kind of all of that would happen here. And we could flow chart out each of those elements or put those into an action box that just lists each of those things that need to happen is first. Is determining who starts? Yeah, that could be part of it too, or you might consider that to be part of the game. There are actually there are two options in the official rules for Uno about who who takes the first turn. So you might want to. Uh, that's one of the options. They suggest a, another alternate too. Um, so you might want to start off with that, like the first play of the game is determined by. Mm -hmm. That's that's the other one. It says if you want, you can have the youngest person go first. There you go, man. So, so the start is the start, the start and the setup. Um, then the, the main part that you guys are going to be involved with is going to be this big old rectangle. That's not a rectangle. Let's try a rectangle. This rectangle here, which this is the actual, the actual gameplay. All right. So um, this is where this is what your group's going to be focusing on. Break this out into what is the actual gameplay. So what happens in what sequence? All right. So the game is played, or a turn is played. Then there is. It's not really a decision, but it's a place where a determination has to be made, and that would be. Is. Is the game over? All right. So, um, as we said, for this particular game, that is, did somebody just play their last card? So you'll be breaking all of this out, and at the end of each turn, we come to this as sort of the last step of a of a turn. Is the game over? If the game is over, or is not over, then we would loop back into the gameplay. Sorry, this is not looking very pretty, but um, I usually do better work than this. But um, So if the answer is no, then you loop back in and you'll have to figure out where exactly do you loop back into. If you've got initial steps that don't happen more than once, then you would loop back in after that, those steps. Um, oh, and there should be, I should have connecting lines here, and I should have one here, all right. And then uh, the other option, obviously, is if the game is over, then that final little piece is 
the end. And if you're doing the official official things, that the part of the ending would be counting up the score, figuring out how many points everybody got, and things like that. Um, but we're for the purposes of tonight, we're just going to assume we're just playing a single game. So that's our, if the answer is yes, then the game's end. So at the very top level, this is what a game of Uno looks like. We set up the game. The gameplay happens, which is in a series of rounds or turns. At the end of each turn, we determine if the game is over. If the game is over, we end the game. If the game is not over, we loop back into the gameplay and play another turn. Play another turn, play another turn, play another turn until we finally get to the point where the game ends, all right? So your group, like I said, is going to focus in on breaking this rectangle out, all right? Assume that we've set the game up. What happens then once we're actually starting the game? What happens between the start of the game and determining if the game is over? So that's what I want you to, to flow chart out, okay? So we'll see how this goes. I'll be interested to see the results. Everybody's going to be working on the same game. So part of it is going to be sort of comparing what each group comes up with um, to see if you considered the same things or structured it in the same way. Um, but we'll just we'll we'll see how it goes. All right. So we have four, six, eight, and we have twelve tonight. So I think we'll work in three groups of four. I think that's probably workable. Um, each group can come up and get a big old piece of paper or two if you think you're going to make errors and want more than one. Um, I've got plenty of pads of post-its here, so each group could take a full stack of post-its. Uh, um, yeah, it can be, especially because some of the groups are missing half their groups. We can, we'll, we'll be mixed up for this activity. All right, we'll work, we'll work in our game groups later on. But for this one, let's just divide up into four, three equal groups of four. Uh, you can grab a couple of markers if you'd like to color code or draw lines or write on the post-its with them, or you can use your own pens, pencils, whatever you've got. I have a roll of masking tape. Um, sometimes with these, it's easier. I know if there's a group like back there, you could tape the paper up to that whiteboard. That would make a nice surface to draw on. If people want to tape it up to a wall to work on it. There's tape up here too. Um, so uh, what do we want to do for groups? Should I count off? I, I don't generally do that with adult learners. It seems somehow. You Can you guys divide yourselves up? Four there and then two divided into four there and then four here. You want to do the four yeah, sort of in the middle there? Okay. Yeah, and again, if, if a group wants to go out in the hall, you can, I guess. Um, <laughs> That's it. That was it. Hullabaloo. <laughs> yeah, I think I was thinking. <laughs> but yeah, I was totally. Oh, that was another one. Cranium also had, um, had a kinesthetic component, too. Because certain of the activities, you would like have to get up and do something physical, or like um, she also had a it was a cat and a hat game that involved a lot of the turns, like you had to like crawl around the room backwards or jump over something or something like that. So. Oh, I didn't give a I didn't give a time frame. It's it's six ten. Uh, so let's try for like 40 minutes or so, see how it goes. We'll take a little break, we'll do a little debrief, and then still have about a half an hour or so to work in our game groups after that. So we'll aim for 6.50ish or so. Yeah, if you... Um, down that way or down towards the other computer lab? I know the other the other computer lab has a room outside of it, but I think Dr. Bed's teaching a class. If you want to, you could use, if you want a surface, you could, if you wanted to work on the floor, you could put this down and put that on top of it if you don't want to draw on the 
Perfect. I don't care. I don't know how to draw anything, so. Good thing you've got an art <laughs> game. <laughs> so you're, okay. you're cool. So I, if you, that might give you better. Yeah, but. Why don't you just move that scanner off? I can't really stretch. Oh. She just has Okay, yeah, we're, whatever you want to do, yeah. make it work. Yeah, I didn't want to pressure anybody. Or I mean, you could maybe you, you know, like you could tape it up on the wall there. You'd have to reach, reach over. Whatever, make it work. Yeah, take as many as you need. Yeah, so imagine, like, basically you've got an arrow coming into your chart that's coming from start the start. Okay. So then, like, what, you know, this, this rectangle, you're basically blowing up this rectangle onto that whole page. A yeah. uh, rectangle and this rectangle is the game over. That should, this should be sort of the bottom thing yeah. is, is the game over. And then that would be looping. You'd have to show where that would loop back into. Okay. So. This arrow is coming into your paper, and this arrow is going out of your paper. Professor Miller? Yes. Can we explain the start? No. What What you can do? Uh, here, I'll come out because I just
But then he play a wild card, and then I would have to do all four. Right, but that would be another branch. Right, because like you play a green card or a seven, you play a wild card. Right. You might not have anything in a basket, but this is going to be like so three. So you write that. So say it could be a wild card. Can it be a branch drop? Yeah, it's there. So let me, uh, I, think think one, I think once in a while it's two, two, three, and three. No. I don't remember well, when, when you when you use a card, you don't, oh yeah, because your whole goal is to get rid of it. You don't, yeah, you don't have to the only time up. you draw is if you cannot play a card. So there's three branches. Or if somebody tell, plays a card that tells you you have to draw. You could play a matching color or a matching number. So oh, let me put matching color, matching number in the second one. No, I, put, I think that could be on the same one. I think it could be on the same one. Matching color or matching number. Yeah. Matching. 